The acting public protector has cleared President Ramaphosa as far as conflict of interest in the Palapala matter is concerned. Is he out of the woods? Or is this a whitewash? Let's get into it. So, your report says that you considered the meaning of concepts of paid work or remunerated work as gleaned from various sources and the overarching conditions which arise from most definitions refers to an employment relationship or a self-employed person who provides work or renders physical or mental labor for remuneration or payment in money or in kind. He says in that clip, I'm a farmer, I sell. When you sell, you sell to get money. You don't sell to not get money. So is that not a job? Is a farmer not a job? No, it is not. What it, is it? It is two phrased. You can either have financial interest or you can perform it in terms he of a job. He says I sell. But the information that we have before us in terms of selling is that he doesn't physically sell. And at the end of the clip, if you listen carefully, he mm -hmm. says they go to the farm to purchase. So and in this instance, if you look into this instance, which we were investigating, at the time when the sale took place, he was not at the farm. It is the manager who conducted the transaction and who further confirms that if he, if Love is not there, Van Velag is there mm. to be able to interact with the buyers. Mm. So we do not have information that the president interacts with the buyers. So yes, he says he sells, but does he physically sell? Does he put his mind and physique into the runnings of that farm on a day-to-day -day basis? So Spread the fire, welcome back to SMWX, and in today's episode, we dive deep into the Public Protector's Palapala Report, an important milestone and landmark on South Africa's political landscape this year. It has caused mixed reactions, to say the least, some accusing the Public Protector of whitewashing President Cyril Ramaphosa's wrongdoing and others saying that this report vindicates President Ramaphosa as he has maintained all along. In today's episode, I want to break down our analysis into this report into three different parts. Firstly, we're going to look at the background. And after you listen to that section, you'll be up to date really understanding the context because we can't understand the reasoning in this report if we don't understand the background. So we'll look at that. Following that, we're going to look at the substantive reasoning in the report and see to what extent it holds. And we're going to look at three aspects of the report. First, the notion of conflict of interest and see how the public protector reasoned towards Ramaphosa not having a conflict of interest. Then we're going to dive into the question of paid work, which in some ways is related to conflict of interest. And then finally, we're going to look at some of the findings around President Ramaphosa's VIP protection unit. So let's dive into it and look at each of those aspects. Okay, so to understand this report, we need to dive into the background. And I think three things are salient as we look into what happened. The first is to remember that the current acting public protector is the person who's looking into this only because President Cyril Ramaphosa suspended the public protector Busisiwe Mkwebane last year on the 9th of June. And this suspension happened soon after Mkwebane sent Ramaphosa a list of 31 questions about Palapala. Now, Mkwebane's suspension was declared unlawful by the Western Cape High Court, but Ramaphosa appealed that before the Constitutional Court. And for some bizarre reason, eight months since that appeal at the Constitutional Court, we haven't got a judgment on whether that suspension was lawful or not. So that's why it was the acting public protector 
and not Busisiwe Mkwebane, who delivered this report and oversaw the investigation at least, at least for the most significant parts. The other important background to note is that there was a parliamentary inquiry into this same or at least similar questions. That was led by a former Chief Justice, Sandile Ngobo, and they found in different ways to the Public Protector's report. You might remember that happened towards the end of last year. Finally, this report has taken quite a long time to come to fruition, and there are many other different reports and investigations that we're waiting for, whether that's from the Hawks. Then there's a, a, a South African Reserve Bank report, which is really important in terms of foreign currency. And there's still some further information that we need to get from the South African Reserve, uh, from SARS, the South African Revenue Service. So Saab and SARS both have a part to play in this report. So effectively, we are now at the point which we have been waiting for. The public protector has released her findings. She has effectively exonerated Cyril Ramaphosa on a series of allegations. But let's dive into exactly what that means and exactly whether the public protector's report stands up to scrutiny. Okay, so the first really interesting part of this report concerns conflict of interest. In a nutshell, this is when you hold two different interests. Often when you're a public office bearer, one of them is private, like you own a business. The other one is public, you have a public position. And those two in interests are in conflict. You can't execute them both at the same time without one impacting on the other. Now, the ATM, which was the party that brought this complaint to the public protector, as well as the DA, effectively said, look, you can't have a president who on the one hand owns a massive financial interest in a farm which is doing trade to the tune of millions of rands on the one hand and be president at the same time on the other hand, because those two things may compete with each other. And you may be able to get undue benefits from the one because of your position and the other, or you may wield your position to get the undue benefits. And so there's just an uneasy tension between, on the one hand, owning a business, and on the other hand, being a president at the same time. Now, South Africa's laws do consider this. So there is the Constitution, and there is Section 96 of the Constitution, which really covers the question of conflict of interest. There's also legislation in terms of the Executive Members Ethics Act, the Public Protectors Act. And then there's a lot of case law that has emerged, especially around the question of presidential conflicts of interest. So the public protector had to have regard to the legal constitutional legislative framework and then determine whether in these specific facts with this specific business, this president and this office, there was actually a conflict of interest. And effectively, the big thing she finds is that there was no conflict. Now, this is a little bit of a strange finding, if you ask me. And that's because when it comes to presidents, conflict of interest becomes heightened because of the importance of the presidential office. So this is not just any old governmental employee. This is the president. And the higher your office, the higher your responsibility to preserve the integrity of that office and to ensure that that office isn't tainted by other personal financial interests that may influence your discharge of your duties in that office. Now, the Constitutional Court in the Ngandla judgment, you'll remember President Jacob Zuma kind of was seen to have improperly benefited. What? Getting a private benefit from his public office at Nganja. And in that constitutional court judgment, there was an interesting line in paragraph nine, which I'd like to read. It says, the potential conflict lies here. And this is in relation to president's conflicts of interest. On the one hand, says Justice Mokhoeng, writing for the full court, 
The president has the duty to ensure that state resources are used only for the advancement of state interests. You can only use state resources for the advancement of state interests, not private interests, not business interests. So if you have access to state resources, a conflict arises where those resources are deployed for any other interest other than state interests. It continues, on the other hand, there is a real risk of him closing an eye to possible wastage, that being the president, if he is likely to derive a personal benefit from indifference. Let's just take a step back there because that's to do with the Nganja facts. But basically, a president may overlook certain benefits that they get if they believe that they're able to derive benefits from some kind of conflict of in interest. That conflict may cause them to overlook the way the conflict of interest is happening. That's the whole point of conflict of interest. It, 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 it creates a problem in your lens because your own bias and your own interest causes you not to see certain things. And finally, the court then says, to find oneself on the wrong side of section 96 of the Constitution, which is the relevant section, all that needs to be proven is a risk. And here's the kicker. It does not even have to materialize, that being the risk. So when it comes to a president, what the court is saying is that you are in a conflict of interest if there is even a risk that there is a confluence between your private interests and your public duties. Not that you did anything, just that you created a risk that something may be done. And that risk doesn't have to materialize. The risk itself is the conflict. And you can see why that matters, because when you're the president, when you have national secrets at your disposal, when you can decide whether the country goes to war or not, whether you take the main economic decisions, not for your family, but for the entire country, whether you wield, when you wield the, the disproportionate amount of power in government, anything you do that exposes you to a potential private risk is itself a conflict. So when the public protector turns around and says that she can't find any evidence that there was a conflict between President Ramaphosa's private interests through the Palapala farm and his public duties, it's difficult to see how she arrived at that conclusion based on the mere existence of a risk of conflict. I would argue this risk actually materialized in the way that the president reported this to his presidential protection services and said, please look into that. At that very moment, a conflict arose. Was the president who called in his uh, VIP protection service? Yeah, we all know VIP protection services always follow the law, right? Hello, Deputy President Paul Mashadile. When he called in General Wali Roeder, this is his protection service person. And he said he was in Ethiopia at the time, in Addis Ababa. And he said, I hear that there's been a break-in at my farm. Can you look into this? Ruda was there because he's the president. He told him to look into it. Was he telling him to look into it to protect a public resource or a private interest? At that very moment... Not only, in my view, was there a conflict that was at risk, but the conflict materialized, which far exceeds the test that was set in the Nganja judgment in terms of conflict of interest. So I think that the public protector's refusal to appreciate the existence of the risk, you don't need overt evidence where a president calls someone and says, here, I've got two conflict conflicting interests. I want to use the one interest to help the other. You're never going to find evidence like that. What you need to see is, is there the existence of two separate risks that are at risk of conflicting to the objective observer. How the public protector didn't see that uh, beats and baffles me. But you can, you can go into the report and see for yourself um, what she says. I think one of the, one of the mistakes in the report is to look at 
the president's actions in relation to the theft, not the president's mere holding of this financial interest and his admittedly arm's length, but actual participation in some of the activities of, of the farm as seen in the admitted facts in the report. So conflict of interest, I'm not so sure the, the report is going to stand up to legal scrutiny on that. I think if wise advocates run similar arguments to the arguments that were run in the Nkandla case, talking about pure exposure to risk, we're going to see the the findings at least impugned, if not challenged. You know, the Nkandla case is actually interesting. I, I see a lot of people saying, yeah, but you can't compare Nkandla and, and Palapala. And of course, there are relevant differences there. But there are actually important similarities that I think have been overlooked. Firstly, they both involve the president in their private and public capacities at the time. They both involve public protector's reports and the public protector inquiring into the president. But thirdly, they also involve the police and the way that the police and private protection units around presidents or the police in the case of Nganza create protection around the president that can cause a conflict between private and public protection. You'll recall in the Nganzla case, the police decided, no, we need to build these security upgrades at Nganzla because we need to secure the president. But then it was like, but we're securing his private residence. So which one are we securing? Here, we also have a police official who goes and does an investigation, which he's not authorized to do under the auspices of the president. And you have the public protector inquiring into that. So I actually think mutatis mutandis, as they say in the law, uh, all uh, the other facts taken into account that are different. There are many interesting parallels between Gandla and Palapala. But let's get into this, the, the next question, which is about paid work, because I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to be said here, too. Because Section 96 of the Constitution also has this prohibition against members of the executive, like the president, undertaking paid work. And you can understand, like you can't be a president and be moonlighting somewhere and working, you know, just doing whatever you want, because clearly not only will your attention be divided, but your interests will also be divided. There, there would be a question about who your loyalty was to, the one paying you on the side or the, the presidential salary. So you can't do paid work. Now, there's a fascinating legal question here as to whether the president was engaged in paid work or not. And there are actually diverging views in the public protector's report versus the Nobo panel report, which I think we need to accentuate. See, the public protector took a very narrow view of what paid work is. So President Ramaphosa owns this farm. The farm is a closed corporation. He is the sole member. So he's the sole owner of this farm. But he doesn't engage in day-to-day -day operations every single day from nine to five, right? So he, he's, not, he's not on the farm, clearly, every day looking after his buffalo. <laughs> by, by the way, the Public Protectors Report uh, includes the names of the buffalo that was su supposedly sold to Mr. Hazim, uh, which are quite hilarious. So the, some of the names are Kimberly. Um, we've got uh, Layla as well. And uh, Layla, apparently one of Layla's uh, descendants, because they also have like the lineages. There's, there was another descendant called Whitey, the buffalo. Shout out to Whitey. Uh, I think there's one called like Dronker or something. Shout out to Dronker, the buffalo. So this episode is dedicated to Dronker, Whitey, Layla, Kimberly, and all their brethren. Moment of silence. <laughs> Anyway, so so hey, I just you just read the names of the buffalo people. It's literally it's literally hilarious. Um so so the public protector basically back to paid work says, okay, look, there's a difference between being a worker or being someone who's paid to do something and being an owner of an asset. And the public protector says effectively. Yes, the president owns the farm, but he doesn't work on the farm. And the prohibition is against paid work. He's not getting paid to work on the farm. He just owns it. So he kind of has a passive income in the farm, but he's not actually doing paid work. That's the public protector's argument. It's an interesting one. It's quite a constrictive interpretation of what paid work means. 
Justice Nobo looked at exactly the same question and came to this conclusion. In paragraph 191 of his report, he says, In our view, the provisions of section 96.2a, which is the paid work provision, puts a member of cabinet to a choice. The choice is, you either remain in business and do not become a member of cabinet, or you become a member of cabinet and relinquish your business interest during your membership of cabinet. So his understanding of paid work is much wider than just, oh, you're an employee who gets a salary from some place. If you have, if you're doing some active or if you retain some active involvement and you're getting a financial gratification, maybe even as a, an owner or a controlling owner, we can think of that as paid work. Yes, you may intervene um, sporadically. Maybe it's not nine to five every day, but you intervene. People call you. Can you do this? Uh, Kimberly's feeling sick today. Should we buy some food for, for Kimberly? You say we can buy some. <laughs> uh, so, so basically, Receiving a gratification while performing effort can be seen as paid work, even if you're just a controlling shareholder. So we have a dispute here, which is ultimately going to have to be resolved by the courts, which is, do we define paid work really narrowly to be like you're an official employee? Or is the purpose of that section to prevent people from getting financial gratification via where they have a controlling influence. Now, again, I side with Nobo on this one because quite frankly, let's look at the absurdity of the public protector's report. What that means is, if you're the president of the country and you're a farm worker at Palapala, then you've contravened the constitution. As a farm worker, you clean around the kraals and you help with the feeding of the cattle. As a lowly farm worker, you can't do that constitutionally, according to the public protector. But if you own the farm and you can call people and tell them where to put the money on the farm and where the money should go and you, you, you own the land on the farm through a trust, that's okay. How can the farm worker have more of a conflict of interest than the farm owner? So we need a more expansive appreciation of paid work. If that expansive appreciation of paid work is too expansive, then still you fall into the crosshairs of the conflict of interest provisions outside the paid work provisions. And there's simply no way around having one private interest and another public interest. And the fact of the matter is the public protector used all sorts of legal leisure domain or... Uh, acrobatics or tactics to avoid a very obvious truth, which is that the president has a deep private interest on the one hand, a deep public interest on the other, and those two things clashed on the day of that robbery and in the weeks following that robbery when he tried not only to suppress it or at least not tell the public, but also to get to the bottom of it via his protection service. So that's my view on the paid work question. We've looked at paid work. We've looked at conflict of interest. Now I want to turn attention to General Wally Ruder and see how come the public protector found against him while not finding against the president. So the public protector found that the president didn't have a conflict of interest and in the way that he asked General Wally Ruder, his VIP protection head, his security head, to look into this matter once he found out there had been a theft on his farm, he didn't exercise a conflict of interest or he wasn't entangled in a conflict of interest and at the time he wasn't engaged in paid work. So that's what the public protector found on the president. But interestingly, she changes tack when it comes to the person below the president, General Wally Roda himself, because she says he acted improperly when he created this investigation into what happened at Palapala. And basically, have a look at this. Let, let me simplify it for you. You have a president. You have his right-hand security person. 
the president has a theft on his farm. He turns to a security person who's employed by the state, not by the president, and he says, hey, there was a theft on my private property. Can you look into it? The security person is like, don't worry, I've got you covered. I'll look into it. Then, according to the president's version repeated by the public protector in her report, that's the last the president heard about it. The fact that Wally Roda went on, investigated, went to the farm, did all this stuff, tried to find out what happened. Apparently, the president knew nothing about that. He wasn't asking him what happened. He was like, can you look into it? And then he never followed up and said, did you look into it? What happened when you looked into it? What's going on on Palapala? Uh, please, can you give me a report back regularly in terms of what's happening? What have you found? That's really where the story breaks down. And the public protector says, Wally Roda effectively just went rogue. He just went and did this investigation without real authorization or constant communication with the president. And she finds he acted improperly in that, in the course of those duties. My question is, how does the security person do all this improper stuff without the knowledge of the person on whose behalf they are doing it? So in order to believe that version, you have to believe that the president had no idea what was going on on his private residence. And again, that just reintroduces the question of conflict of interest because all of this is happening on your own property, not a government property, your private property. You know, I think the interesting thing on this as well is to compare it with what happened with, with Deputy President Paul Mashatile. I'm sure you also saw those viral videos of security personnel getting out of a black SUV and with armed, you know, what appears to be assaulting people on the side of the road. Uh, for what reason, we don't know. But you can see how these VIP protection services almost become a law unto themselves. And there are many anecdotal stories of how this happens. I even have my own one about what happened to me at the Marikana Commission uh, one day, which I'll tell about the presidential protection services. So we actually have two similar situations in which the VIP protectors of these powerful politicians take the law into their own hands. But the question is, why do they feel the license to do that? Is it because they're so close to powerful people that they know those powerful people can sweep it under the carpet for them? Or do the powerful people use them and get them to take the fall if anything goes wrong while protecting themselves? I think both the Mashadile and the Palapala situation reveal a deep problem with presidents, their private security, and the way that that private security operates outside the law, sometimes to the benefit of the presidents. So let's wrap all of this up. Where do we stand? Well, I think the public protector's report is definitely a good thing for President Ramaphosa. It has given him a new lease on life. It really has exonerated him in one of the most important inquiries, which is, did he breach the constitution? Did he have a conflict of interest? So there's no doubt that this is a good thing for President Ramaphosa politically, as well as uh, legally for now. But this is by no means the end of the road. Firstly, as I said, there are other investigations that we're waiting for. So we'll see. I have no idea what's taking uh, the Reserve Bank so long to just tell us about, you know, this foreign currency situation. Um, but I'm fairly certain, and it's already been announced by the ATM, the African Transformation Movement, the party, political party in parliament that brought this complaint, as well as the Democratic Alliance through John Steenhuisen, that they intend on reviewing this report. What does that mean? They want to go to court and say to the court effectively, look, the public protector issued this report, but we think it's wrong for these reasons. And they will then apply for the court to have a deeper look at the report. And if it is wrong, then the court can, you know, change the report it can at least uh, criticize the public protector's reasoning, and that may reopen some of these questions. And that's exactly what happened with Nganla, except in the reverse. So in Nganla, the public protector found against Zuma. Zuma didn't institute the things she said he should do, and then parties took that to court and say, said he had to do what the public protector said he had to do, which is pay back the money. This is the reverse. In this case, the public protector has found for the president. But 
the complainants, the ATM and the DA, think that they that that has not held the president accountable enough. So they're actually going to go to court on the reverse basis and say, we believe the public protector is there to create accountability, especially presidential accountability. And therefore, when the public protector lets a president off lightly with just a slap on the wrist, when in fact what is actually required is far more accountability, then the public protector should bear her teeth more more obviously. It's going to be an interesting case, and we'll be right there to analyze it. But we've been analyzing Palapala right from the beginning. I've made a promise on this channel. We're not going to let go of the issue. And we'll continue to follow it because it's fascinating in terms of law, politics, and all things in between. Hope you enjoyed this and got some information out of the Public Protector's report. Let's have a debate down below. This is a preliminary analysis. The report is very new. So, of course, when you go back, reread and reread, you always find new things. Let me know if you think anything in my analysis needs to be updated. Let's have a debate down below. What is conflict of interest? Does Section 96 apply here? Was the pre president doing paid work or not? What do you think of the findings on Rueda? versus the findings on the president. What do you think of the public protector's report? I'm really keen to know your thoughts. Like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment for Kimberly and Layla down below. Aye.